Okay, time to start. Today we're going to speak about the definition of quantum theory. Quantum theory was born at the turn of the 20th century when people discovered that many phenomena related to light and atoms could not be described in the framework of classical physics. Planck, Einstein and others started trying some models that approximate some of these phenomena. And this went on by successive approximations, what is called the old quantum theory, until in 1926, Schrödinger and Heisenberg independently came up with a mathematical formalism that turned out to be equivalent uh, among each other, and that is what we call nowadays quantum theory proper. Now, why is quantum theory so different from classical physics? Why it took so long time to uh, find the solution? The key difference is in the way the two theories describe physical systems. So today, description is going to be the key word. The description is normally taken for granted in basic physics. That's why it needs to be discussed today. Let us start with a very simple example describing a car moving on a road. So here's my road. And uh, we need the speed of the car. And now, here in this uh, diagram that we call the space of states, we can describe the different states, the different properties that the cars can have. For instance, if I have a car that is here, what does it mean? Well, it's a car that is at this position on the road, and the speed is positive, so it's moving, let's say, in this direction. If I had a car down there, it would be a car at the same position on the road, but moving in the opposite direction. Now let's see how we describe physical properties in this framework. One property we can ask for is, for instance, what are the cars that are east of this location? And, well, these are these cars. This set describes the cars that are, are on the east. Now what are the cars that are violating the speed limit. Well, the speed limit is somewhere here and also somewhere there for the cars going in the opposite direction. And the cars that are violating are those that are going faster. So that those that are down here or up there. Okay, so far so good. Now, a very important structural property of this that I'm doing that you will find very obvious, but I have to stress it now, is what are the cars that are east of this location and violate the speed limit. Well, obviously, these cars will be represented by the intersection of the two sets. So it's these and these. Very well. So this construction now can be extended to any classical physical system. Let me just do it now in a more abstract way. I erase these. We have a set, set called the space of states, and physical properties are described by subsets. That's a physical property. That's another physical property. The intersections are those physical systems that have both properties at the same time, and of course, the most precise description of a physical system would be the smallest possible subset, which is a point. A point can be also seen as the intersection of all the sets that contain itself. Now, this all sounds very, very normal, and indeed, that's how we think every day. This is what goes wrong with quantum theory. We cannot maintain anymore this way of describing physical systems after the beginning of the 20th century. Now, what happens in quantum theory? Well, in quantum theory, we also have a space of states because we must be able to describe properties of physical systems, but it's not a set. It is a vector space. And the rules now are that physical properties are subspaces, not subsets, of this vector space. 
Now, in order to give you an example, let me maybe move to a different drawing. I, go, I try to go to a three-dimensional drawing. It's not the three-dimensional of space that we are accustomed to. It's three-dimensional in this abstract vector space of the states. So, a state would be a subspace, which means, well, it can be a plane. Uh, it continues all over, right? just a representation of a plane. It could be a line. That's another subspace. It could be another line. All these objects are subspaces of the vector space and thus define physical properties. Now, there is a very important rule in quantum theory that marks the difference between this construction and the classical construction, is that properties can be perfectly distinguished only if the, if the subspaces are orthogonal. For instance, this plane is orthogonal to this line. Therefore, I could say, well, this is a physical property, and this is a physical property I can distinguish perfectly. Example, this is a particle with energy equal zero. This is a particle with energy equal one electron volt. These are two different values of energy. I can measure the energy, I can find where it's zero or one electron volt. But now, what happens with this line? This line is not orthogonal to the plane, and it's not orthogonal to that, the other line. So this is a different physical property. Let's say the speed is two kilometers per hour. That cannot be measured at the same time, cannot be associated with a precise value at the same time as I associate a precise value to the energy. This is where quantum theory differs radically from classical physics. Here, there are different physical properties, the speed, the energy, the position. They cannot be defined all at the same time. Whereas before, I could define all of them at the same time and take the intersection to decide which state has all those properties. Yeah, so maybe it still sounds a bit confusing. Why are there all these vectors and all these subspaces? And, and probably there's no way out of that uh, because that's not the natural way we look at things. So in a sense, it will remain a little bit confusing. Uh, so are we giving up on understanding nature? No, no, we're not giving up understanding nature. We are still physicists. And this formalization is a way of understanding nature. We have a theory, perfectly well defined. Well, I didn't yet explain it, but it's perfectly well defined. And uh, it has connections with reality. We know how to connect these mathematical objects to what is out there. And we know how to get predictions. These predictions are very accurate. So definitely there is a form of understanding here. But what we are probably giving up is the possibility of having a mental image of the process that is going on. But where do those vector spaces come from? Is there a simpler way to understand this? If by simpler you mean that you want to get back to a situation where this is again a set, like in the classical, normal, intuitive way, then the answer is no. We will not be able to go back there. We know that this phenomena cannot be described in a classical framework. So any future theory will have to use something different from the set that we had before. Now, why it's a vector space and not something else? This is a question that goes beyond the content of this lecture. Some people have tried to approach it through axiomatics or through physical principles, but I cannot enter into those. Whoa. Um, the lecture has ended. The Everyone left. Oh, okay. Um, how was the lecture? You didn't miss much because the lecture is super confusing anyway. But there will be an exam tomorrow! <laughs> <laughs>